welcome to another episode of Life Lessons with Dr. Bob, where you'll hear highly accomplished and fascinating guests talk about the challenges they've overcome and the winning mindsets that have led them to great success. And now your host, Dr. Bob. Welcome to another episode of Life Lessons with Dr. Bob. You know, in these episodes, I spend time talking to very interesting and successful individuals to hear their stories and to discover the key elements of their personalities, the secrets of success that led them to where they are today. My guest today is Ami Horowitz. Ami is a documentary filmmaker and activist. Although he has produced one full-length film, which was called You and Me, that exposed the failure of the UN peacekeeping mission in Rwanda, he is best known for his many short films that expose serious contemporary issues ranging from white privilege to the mandate requiring masks to protect against COVID. His videos are widely watched either on the web or on popular cable news channels ranging from Fox to CNN. He often uses satire to expose the fallacy behind commonly held beliefs of the left. His videos have high viewership because they're informative and entertaining. I'll give you one example and then we're going to explore more of them with Ami in a bit. In his video, which is entitled, How White Liberals Really View Black Voters, he goes to Berkeley, California, and interviews white students about voter ID laws. Without exception, the white students say that voter ID laws are racist. Why? Because blacks are less likely to have IDs. These type of people don't live in areas with easy access to DMVs or other places where they can get identification. Some of those people interviewed went so far as to say that blacks didn't know how to get an ID because they don't even know where the DMV is. In the second half of the video, Ami goes to Harlem, where he interviews random black people on the street. What does he discover? That everyone has an ID and that they all know where the local DMV is. Some even gave Ami the actual address. That's the only thing I brought with me. Those are legit, yeah. those are legit IDs. Do you know where the ID, the, the DMV is around you? It's on 125th Street and 3rd Avenue, I believe. You know how to get there? Yeah. Do you have a problem getting there if you have to get there? No. To me, this video shows how ignorant and condescending the left is. You know, I don't know if there's such a thing as white privilege, but there certainly is white ignorance. Ami, welcome to the show. Thank you for reading the introduction exactly how my mom wrote it. <laughs> Well, I know that I've known you for quite some time, but uh, I didn't know all about uh, your background. So uh, I did uh, a little bit of research. It's easy to find. And I discovered that you went to USC where you majored, I think, in political science and philosophy. Mm -hmm. And soon after you graduated, uh, you joined an investment banking firm, Lehman Brothers, where you worked for about 15 years uh, uh, raising money and making a lot of money. It's a far cry from uh, interviewing kids at Berkeley or going to Sweden to interview uh, immigrants or the view towards uh, uh, Islamic immigrants there. Tell us how your life took a turn and, and what made that happen. Going from investment banking to uh, making crazy videos in the street is not a natural progression. <laughs> I thought that was the path that all investment bankers took. When in orientation, they told us in 10 years, you're going to be a filmmaker. No, it was a very hard uh, right turn because, of course, I would never make a hard left turn. And um, I can tell you the exact moment where it happened. Uh, it was a Saturday night, and I was at home uh, watching the Michael Moore film Bowling for Columbine. I was watching it, and for some reason I was drifting off, and I started thinking about the UN. I don't know. can't tell you why. just popped in my head. The United Nations. The United Nations. Yep. And I was thinking about how damaging the institution is to our world, to our liberty, how anti-Semitic it is. And I started to think, you know, here are these, I have these such passionate, strong views about this topic, but the only people I can tell them are my kids and my wife, and they don't want to hear it. So I thought, okay, how do I get this point across? So I thought, well, I could write a book, but I'm too lazy and few people are going to read it. 
I thought I could write an article for a magazine. I've done that before. But uh, the same 50,000 people who agree with me will read it. doesn't move the needle. And then I looked over at Michael Moore's movie, Bowling for Columbine. And I thought to myself, what a, as, as much as I dislike his politics, um, what a really interesting, engaging medium, this notion of like black sat dark, dark satire to make a, a, a larger political point. And I thought this guy really nailed this, nailed the medium, nailed the topic. So I was like, you know what? Um, I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to make a movie, full length feature film. And uh, I'm always, I, I'm a guy who's always comfortable being outside of my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And this was way outside of my comfort zone. Right? I've never done anything like this. I mean, I went to USC, which is a great film school, but I never went to film school. Um, but I, I, I went to sleep determined to quit my job and make this movie. And that's exactly what I did. I didn't never, never even look back. And you didn't have a producer, writer, you didn't have anything. I had at that point. nothing. You just had the idea that the UN is not doing the world a service, right? Uh, and, and it sort of makes sense. I remember when I was a little kid talking to my father, he said, look, the UN is just an assemblage of people from various countries. And most of those countries aren't free. They're not democratic. Probably uh, maybe 10% of the countries are democratic. The, ru the rest are run by, uh, by um, uh, military or they're run by strong dictators, men. strong men. And why would you think that the UN should do good when it's represented by those kind of people? Yeah, and more, more than that, yeah, 100%. And, and that was the point I want to get across. Because if you look at, you know, if you talk to people around the world, even in this country, the vast majority of people will say, oh, no, the U.N. is a force for good. Mm -hmm. it, it helps create, you know, international order. They really have no clue what the agenda of that organization is. So, like I said, it was outside my comfort zone. And more okay, than but did you have a topic? I mean, the topic was let's expose the U.N., ex at least expose the, the bad things, some of the bad things, maybe the good things, but we're going to expose the U.N. And how did you get uh, get focused on Rwanda. Was that a, a, Rwanda was only one part, one mm -hmm. section of the movie. Mm -hmm. It was maybe 10, 15 percent of the movie. Uh, but Rwanda was an obvious one, right? Because here we have, and, and it was important, because here is an organization that was, you know, you could, you, one can make an argument that it came out of the ashes of World War II and the genocide of the Jews, and they're there to make sure that it never happens again. And what did it do? It happened again. Um, right on their noses, in fact, literally on their noses, because they, they were there. They were, they were UN they were there. forces they, they, in Rwanda at the time. There was a UN peacekeeping force in Rwanda. While this was happening. I, the, I, I saw your movie quite a long time ago, probably 10 years ago, and while the, there were the uh, the Hutus and the Tutsis, is that correct? Yeah. There were two tribes that were massacring each other, basically. Uh, one, one tribe was massacring the other one, tribe. Uh, sorry, uh, one tribe uh, was massacring the other. And the UN was sent in as a peacekeeping force. And as I recall, the, they were protecting a group of people which were, which were being protected. Which, which group was it? So the, so the French, it was, it was primarily French troops. Uh, they were there even before the genocide began. Um, but um, they were there um, observing um, not stepping in at all. They were there. They didn't, they, they essentially, you know, they weren't there necessarily to protect the Hutus who were the ones who were committing the genocide, mm -hmm. but they were, were there, uh, witnessed it and simply did nothing. Nothing. I remember a scene where the people are begging them not to leave and these armed troops in, in troop carriers and in tanks. Begging. 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 And they left. They begging. left these people defenseless. In fact, one of the more dramatic moments uh, that we captured in this in, in the in the film was the the Tutsis ran to a UN base, thinking, okay, this is a safe haven. Like at least if we're on the base, we're not going to be slaughtered. And the and the Hutu surrounded the base, and were chanting, "We're going to kill you. We're going to kill the cockroaches." And they just came into the base and wiped everybody out. And with the UN standing watch. And that's in the film. I remember seeing that yeah. scene in the film. Yeah, it's a pretty dramatic scene. So with that, I decided I'm, you know, this is an important, uh, an important film. And it got good reviews, time. right? The, yeah. the movie got pretty good distribution. It got great distribution. We were in theaters all across the United States. Mm -hmm. It was covered by every single major newspaper in the country. And, and, and for the most part, reviewed very well. I mean, New York Times, the Washington Post, like Chicago Sun-Times, all great reviews. Um, yeah, that was, that was, the, that was when I, I got a sense that you could leverage the media to get your 
greater point across. So yeah, mm-hmm. the video or the movie itself mm-hmm. creates a viewership, right? Okay, that's important. But you then leverage that by getting the media to begin talking about it. And then you have a whole new set of audience, a whole new set of eyes that are hearing about your, the controversy or the topic that you're bringing up, not only the ones who watch the video. And that's why I realized if you handle, if you do it right, and it's a hits business, right? It's like they're not, they're not gonna spend that time on every single one. Mm-hmm. But when you get the hit, mm-hmm. and thank God we've had a lot of hits, that's when you can really use the media unwittingly as your ally. Perfect. But uh, so one would have assumed, I would assume that you you made a movie without much training and it was a great movie. I, I don't know how, you, how much Zero money training. was raised. Zero training. Uh, and it was a hit. One would think that, my God, you'd do another full length movie, but you didn't. You would think that. So obviously that was, you know, I was, that was on the forefront of my agenda. It was something I was thinking about, thinking about the next project, thinking I want to do next. And what happened was I decided... So in the interim, between the new idea, I had a couple, um, social media was kind of really kind of taking off. So you had all these new platforms. So when I began the process of the film, there, there wasn't social media. It wasn't, right? A, right? right. So the, you, there were gatekeepers. You had to make a film. You had to have a studio pick it up. They had to distribute it, put it in theaters. It was an entire, pro- you had to be allowed into mm-hmm. that world. Mm-hmm. And thank God I was allowed in that world. But it was a very difficult um, arena to get access to and to be even more to be successful in. So there was no other option. By the time the movie came out, there were, it began, you know, what social media essentially what is for people like me is it's a brand new platform with no gatekeepers. Right? You can just post what you want and the world can see it. Now, some people will be unsuccessful, some people will be successful. It depends on a variety of things within your control and some without your control. But I realized that this was a whole new world and I wanted to kind of dip my toe into it. So what happened was, um, I hooked up with Glenn Beck, who was a big fan of the movie, and he said, look, I'd like you to do something for me. I said, all right. I said, let me think about some, some of my topics, and I, I, I hit upon, you know what? At the time, it was when the, um, uh, the what was that, what is that, uh, what was that movement? Uh, Occupy Wall Street was mm-hmm. the beginning. Mm-hmm. And they were occupying this, in this little area in, in Manhattan. And I said, you know what? I'm going to do a little short video exposing the stupidity of these people. Mm-hmm. So I went out there with a, with, a, you know, with, a, with a small team, you know, camera guy, a sound guy, and me, and that was basically it. And um, we interviewed these people, and it came out to be a really funny. In fact, it's today. It ranks even today as one of my favorite videos, and it was a huge hit. First, right out of the box, and millions of people saw it. I thought to myself, "Holy crap! I just spent millions of dollars on one film on a movie on, on a movie, movie, yeah, which probably got I don't know, maybe maybe a million people saw it, right? Which at for most. A, at most, yeah, which is successful for a documentary, but yep. still." But then I made this short video for, I don't know, 10 grand, probably mm-hmm. less than that at the time, and millions of people saw it. I thought, this is a really interesting dynamic. So it became very hard for me, just from, you know, from an economic level, to say, let me go back and do a whole feature film, spend mm-hmm. five years of my life much on more one risk topic. In a feature film, too. And you never know. Right, yeah. sure. The other one could yeah. be a flop. Whereas if you spend five days doing a short video, so it's it five fails, days. it fails, you move on to the next right, one. Right, right. So that's when I was like, okay, I've got this. This thing might work, mm-hmm. and I've got the skill set. And that's, I mean, that's a big part of it. Is you have the skill set to do it. I mean, a lot of people try to do this and they fail because, yeah, it's a good idea, but if you can't perform, carry it out, right. carry it out execute it, mm-hmm. it's meaningless. Yeah, we're going to talk about what skills were required. Um, to be successful like you are uh, near the end of the podcast. I don't want to tell people my secret. <laughs> well, I can reveal <laughs> some of them because they, they're pretty obvious, but we'll talk about those. Uh, now, let's talk about some more recent uh, films that you've done. They're all short, right? They're, it's either Ami on the Street or uh, A Day with Ami. Or, yeah, they're, they're three to 15 minutes. Right, perfect, perfect. Because people have short attention spans now. And it's not because they're just so busy. It's it's because attention spans are short. I don't know why that is. It might be because of uh, television. When people watch TV or you watch a, a episode of something, they're always switching scenes. I think it's a, eight so, seconds. So or I don't know seconds. what the rules are in this podcast. Am I allowed to disagree with you? Can I push back on you? Oh my God, at your risk. Okay. Yes. Go so ahead. so people don't have as short attention spans as you think. So yeah, I know most people think that. And there's some truth to that, right? With this whole TikTok thing. But the truth is, is that if you create compelling content, they're going to watch it. So, I mean, I'll give you an example. So Tiger King was this documentary series. 
Each one was probably 45 minutes long and there were like 10 of them and they were, it was massively successful. Massively uh, successful. People will watch longer, th- even feature films, mm-hmm. if you can hold, if you can hold their attention. Now, yeah, their attention is short because there's so much crap out there. Mm-hmm. They don't want to spend more than three minutes watching something because because it can't. The people can't hold other people's attention. They're just not good at what they're doing. Mm-hmm. But if you're good, good at what you're doing, good point. People watch movies people for two watch, hours, and they right? will, and right. they absolutely will <clears throat> sit and they will watch it if it's good. Mm-hmm. So it's not that their attention span is short; is that that there's so much crap that they don't want to spend more than two or three minutes watching because it doesn't hold right. their attention. But your your videos are remarkable in that they're very revealing about something about an issue that there are really one firm belief in an issue, and then you show that that it's wrong. But you do it in a way that is captivating and uh, uh, entertaining. It's, they're entertaining at the same time. And that's the goal. That's rare to be able to educate while you're entertaining. That is the goal. So there's a recent, uh, recent videos. I want to go through a few of them. Uh, and, 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 of course, uh, uh, let the uh, uh, viewers know where they can go to see these. They can go to AmiHorowitz.com. They can go to just, just go to go to any any kind of put in your search engine Ami Horowitz and you'll yeah. get all you'll get all the good stuff. YouTube, and a, YouTube a channel on YouTube, YouTube channel, yeah. Facebook. So oh. if, if if the viewers are interested in any of the ones we happen to be discussing, they can easily all find on it. my YouTube channel. And I highly recommend that they go and do that. Thank you. So here are a few that I thought about that are worthwhile. Defund the police now. I think every society I've 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 haven't traveled I've traveled widely around the world. Every society that I know of has police, and that's because every society has some evil people, bad people. They have laws or rules, and you have to have some mechanism of enforcing those laws or rules, and the mechanism are called the police. might be a different name in every country, depending on the language, but there are people generally armed and uh, who get who go to dangerous places or dangerous people, confront them, and arrest them. So... I don't know how the idea of defunding the police gets any traction with anybody who has a brain. But at any rate, you have done there are two or three videos on defunding the police. Uh, there was one that you went, uh, again, I think it was Berkeley, California, uh, where you talked about uh, 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 white, young, college, college-age people about defunding the police. Tell us about that. Okay, so your question, first of all, your question is a good one. Why, why every society has police yeah. f- at, for since the beginning of time, why would you think, because these people that we're dealing with, the hard left, normative values mean nothing to them. Norms mean nothing. History means nothing. Uh, they know better because they're the enlightened ones. They're the virtuous ones. They've been bestowed by Mother Nature, because they don't believe in God. Um, well, they're professors. Or, right, they they were bestowed by something, an enlightenment, a revealed truth that we mere mortals aren't aware of. They've realized we can get rid of the police, and we'll be fine. In fact, and, we'll be and, better and off because they know better. And and, and they uh, they have of course proposed an alternative. It's going to be uh, sort of social workers who go out and try to straighten out the situation. Of oh course. yeah, that's the, that's the, when, when somebody when somebody's about to stick a knife into my throat, what I'm looking for is a social worker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and my daughter is in school for social work. Yeah. Having said that, I'm not looking for my for my my 90 pound daughter to come help me out mm-hmm. when a guy's about to mm-hmm. shiv me in the face. But you interviewed, and and of course the interviews are selected. But I assume that most of the people that you interviewed at Berkeley or where was it? It might have been in. It was in, the, it was in the East Village, New York. It was in, East Village, in New York. Okay, talking to white people, and they all said what? So okay, so it's important to note about my videos. Whenever you see, yes, of course, there's. I, I'm, I'm choosing select, select, select a select from the interviews I've been doing. But what's really important to note is what you see is the predominant perspective. Right. So of you, the people you I've selected to. Uh, and, just for and, inter- and, people who are interesting, have, right, are able to st- string a sentence course. together. You have a lot of dummies out there. Right. Um, so yes, so you, what you, you will never see me cherry pick people's answers that I want. To, for, in order to make Industry. the film work. Right. You will always get the predominant perspectives of what you see on screen. Mm-hmm. Okay. So having said that, so this particular video you're referring to is, uh, this is when the, and remember, it's more than defund the police. This is, we're talking abolish the police. 
right? Now it's, yeah, it's, it's that, going beyond. I mean, there's radical to defund even, but now they want to get rid. These people right. don't want to get rid of the police, and they started telling me about how racist having police are. And they would they have these trees lies that they would continue to push, which is oh they were started by slave catchers. Like they have all this mm-hmm. total bullshit that they've created, which out of nothing really just made it up. Yep. Um, but it's beyond that, they 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 look at law enforcement as an affront to them. And when I ask why, it's because police forces are racist, inherently racist. Even though if you look at the NYPD or the LAPD, it's actually a a, a minority majority police force. So. Mm-hmm. I mean, of course, I don't think they know that or care. But then again, if you do well, ask, they would about, say that those, they've been co-opted. They're, yeah, they've been co-opted. The, right. the, those are uh, uh, white supremacists they're in Oreo black bodies. Co- they're Oreo yeah. cookies. Oreo cookies, right? That's right. Or they're they're, so the, they're not they, really black. What do they call Larry Elder? He's the black face of white, white supremacy. supremacy. That's who. What's exactly how they would tag these people? Right. Right. Um, so I I talked to them and they said, of course, get rid of it, hate it. But more importantly, and this is the most important part, and I and this is a theme of a lot of my videos is that, no, no, I'm not doing this for me. I am I am doing it for the black person, right. for the inner... They're the ones... Who are suffering. Who are suffering. Under and the I, boot. the white savior, yeah. am going to use my political clout to, to get rid of them. the police and to save you, right? right. They're the, the white messiah complex. And I was amazed at the vitriol of these leftists and Hatred. how much they believed Hatred. that the police, all police are evil and that they're evil, particularly against minorities, particularly against blacks. They said it with, with such certainty. Yep. Not that, you know, I've read this and I've read, no, it wasn't that way. And these were, seemed to be educated individuals all, or, or at least I, I, I use the term educated carefully. Uh, they've been to college. Yeah. So, okay. So one thing I learned in life very quickly is there's no connection between intellect and wisdom. Mm-hmm. These people may be intellectual. They may, they may be smart. They have no wisdom whatsoever. Um, where I found the wisdom was the, the second part of the video. When I went to Harlem, did I call up what you want to say? Do you, do you want no, to that's right. Go right. ahead. That's where we're right. going. What? Tell us about the second part of the video. Ah, I'm glad you brought it up. <laughs> so the second part of the video was where I went to Harlem yeah. and I got a collective <clears throat> wisdom. And I said, okay, um, I'm told by Whitey in the East Village that you guys don't want the police, that you're suffering under the heel of oppression of the NYPD. They looked at me like I was crazy. What are you talking about? It's going to be the purge here if you didn't have the police. We need the police. We want the police. And they're going on and on about what would happen to their society and, and their And a number of them spoke about personal experiences yes. that their brother's life was saved by the police or that their uncle was saved by the police and we need the police. Yes. Every one of them said that. Every single. I didn't come across a single person that had a different perspective or a different opinion on this. I mean, I did, and another video I did, which is similar to it, also one of my favorite videos, was this was when Black Lives Matter began mm-hmm. four years ago, mm-hmm. right? Uh, after this, after, after in St. Louis, after mm-hmm. the, um, the, the riots there, uh, Ferg- in Ferguson, outside of St. Louis. And what I did was, and it's, this is one of the few times where I was pleasantly surprised um, by the turn of events because I didn't, you, you never know at the, end, the beginning when you come to the concept, you don't really know how it's going to play out. After I've done this enough times, I have a pretty good set. I have a pretty good radar on what, what will work. And um, so what the, the concept was, I was going to wear an I, um, uh, Cops Lives Matter t-shirt. And I was going to go hidden camera, middle of Harlem. And I was going to stand there with a clipboard saying, please support the NYPD. Now, I don't know exactly what I was expecting, but I thought it might be a negative experience. Boy, was I wrong. So I went out there and people were stopping me on, and they said, oh my God, you are so right. These and are black people. All black people. Right. Of course the police lives matter. Of course cops lives matter. Let me sign this thing. Let me support you. And they started telling me, like you said, these personal stories about how I, I was saved, my brother was saved, this person was saved, how important the NYPD is, how it's a fabric of the society they live in. Mm. It is the exact opposite. Now, okay, so wait a second. So actually, I, wanna, I don't want to steal the thunder of the, of the video. So after the video was done, I was like, okay, this is a great video. It's, it's, um, but it wasn't what I was expecting. Then I thought to myself, I have an idea. Let me now go to uh, uh, Brooklyn, to the hipster area in Brooklyn, and ask them, what do you think will happen if I go 
to Harlem oh, and ask them this video I haven't seen what I what they think yeah. about the NYPD. So I went there, and they looked at me. They said, "Oh my God, there's blood on the streets. They're terrified of the police. There's rage on the streets for their hate of the NYPD." And I'm sitting there taking this all in and feeling this and chuckling because I know what the actual you know what the what the other side of the video is, and it was incredible the disconnect. First of all, there's a disconnect between what they think black people think, and more importantly, it's this racist belief that they know better yeah, right they know better and that was and that was one of the first videos i did on that scenario. now did you ever do a video where you go back into that neighborhood you're not going to find the same people and say you know uh, you told me that the uh, the blacks uh, are very afraid of the police they're oppressed by the police so i went there and here's what i found uh, watch this and, and, and yeah, tell me logistically it's tough because you never tough find them. you can't find right. the same people no, over again going so to. yeah it's a great idea um but they probably think that it was faked they would. I, I would be interested to see what their what yeah. their reaction would be to it, because it would be nice at the same time if we could somehow educate those leftists about what reality is, but they're not interested. They're just not interested. They have their own narrative that they believe so intently, and and it's so prejudicial against blacks. They believe that they are better and that they can tell the blacks what to think. So I would say it's racist. But when I talk to black people about these the, the, the white leftists and their views of, of the black community, they're more gracious than I am. And they'll use the word ignorance. Mm -hmm. They're just ignorant of the situation. Mm -hmm. I, I think they're being I think it's worse a little too ignorance. gracious. Right. I think it's racism. Uh, I think it's white messiah complex. Mm -hmm. um, but the black community is just more judicious than I am. Mm -hmm. Now, you also spend time looking into Black Lives Matter which is a fabulous name. The person, I don't know if it was uh, Abdullah or I forget her name, that came up with the term Black Lives Matter. Nobody they can, need a Nobel in marketing. Yeah, they, right. They should, they Nobel should uh, win a prize in marketing because nobody is going to say Black Lives don't matter. So Black Lives Matter, but do they really matter? What did you discover when you interviewed? Black Lives uh, don't matter one whit to these people. Mm -hmm. The only Black Lives that matter to them are ones that, that push their political agenda. That's it. Uh, it's a very open-ended question because I can, I can speak about an hour about no, what no, I found for Black Lives Matter, but essentially what, I, what you found is, okay, let me take a step back. So there's, there's, two, there's two sides of the same coin with Black Lives Matter. So there, one is the actual organization and then there's the movement, right? The supporters mm. of Black Lives Matter. And they are different, right? They are. Um, but they're two sides of the same coin. So... What does Black Lives Matter, the organization, stand for? Well, and this is not hyperbole, because if you watch the video, it's in the vi they're telling me. What I do in my videos, which is a really important note to make, is, okay, it's, it's one thing to say what people think, but then people say, well, you know, you don't think, you, you're, you're mistaken. They don't actually believe that. It's your position. It's hyperbole. What I do is I have them tell me what they think mm -hmm. in all my videos. On tape. Right. On, right? That's the point. The point is I want them to say it. Not me telling you what mm -hmm. they think. Mm -hmm. They tell you what they think. Mm -hmm. So, for example, the, the people will say, oh, they're not Marxist. They're not anti-Semitic. They don't want to burn down America. They don't hate America, except all those things are true. And how do I know that? Because I spent a year with them and they were telling me over and over again all of these things. They want to burn the entire system down figuratively and literally. Mm -hmm. And when you when when you when I spent time with the Black Lives Matter protesters and who, by the way, don't believe this, both I don't mean they don't believe either one. They don't they don't believe what Black Lives Matter believes, and they don't believe Black Lives Matter believes that. Mm -hmm. Um these are just misguided people. Totally misguided so the people. people who are marching in the street, primarily whites, right, who are marching with Black Lives Matter signs, uh, don't understand what the organization really stands for. Not at all. Yeah. Although I will say this, that I, I asked the Black Lives Matter protesters the same question, which was, do you justify the Black Lives Matter riots and violence? And out of the hundreds of people I asked that question to, the protesters, not people involved in the movement, the protesters, Probably on less than one, two hands, I can tell you how many people said, no, no, it's not justified. The vast majority of protesters justified the violence, the violence to me. So that's why I call them two sides of the same coin. Now, they're not the ones burning it down, but, but they they're the ones giving they're these okay people the it. oxygen yeah. to breathe. Mm 
Yeah. You know, when people say, oh, all Muslims aren't terrorists. That's true. Of course it's not. It's not of course it's a tiny little subset of a subset. But if you, poll after poll, not polls that I've done, polls that major polling companies have done, is that the majority of the Muslim world justifies terrorism. And that, if that the, that the, that's the breathing room they need, the oxygen they need mm -hmm. to do their dirty work. They support work. it. They won't do the dirty work, but they're supporting the dirty work. So this is what I found with BLM. And, and you know, I, look, it, there, you know, it's a, it was a terrible video in the sense that you know, I spent a year undercover with these people and there's really nothing more painful than to watch beautiful American cities burn to the ground, which is what I saw. City you actually city. were there when city they... City after yeah. city. Mm -hmm. I mean, Portland, Seattle, Minneapolis, D.C., New York, Wisconsin. I mean, I can go on and on. Atlanta. I mean, you're seeing city build blocks burn. But more importantly than that is you're, you're looking, as you see it, you realize these aren't just built, like they'll tell you, oh, it's just property. Yeah, it's insured. Who gives a shit? Yeah, it's insured. You know who gives a shit? The people the, the living mom in those and pop right. who spent their life savings and earnings and their blood, sweat, and tears in building a business and you burned it down and they have nothing. Yeah. That's who gives a shit. Right. And, and if you don't think, and, and if you don't give a shit, fuck you. Yeah. And insurance doesn't cover these things. No. Right? Civil insurrection or war is not covered by most insurance. Who who other people who suffer, certainly the store owners, the shopkeepers, but the people who live in that neighborhood. Sure. These are jobs. Where are they are going jobs. to go? Right. This is, this is income that they earn. You know, uh, a, a really important moment in this, in this document, the short documentary I did, is I met with a pastor, Pastor Brooks in Chicago, south side of Chicago. This is a, 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 an angel. This is a guy who, who works through God, mm -hmm. literally. Um, he spends all his time working and trying to redeem the hardest of the hard mm -hmm. in the South Side of Chicago. And he, he brings him into his church. He puts him in schools. And I interviewed him about Black Lives Matter. What do you think about Black Lives Matter? And he said, I, I don't understand what these people are doing. He said, they're burning down our neighborhoods. And they're, la they're dancing on the ashes of the buildings of my people who have built lives here. And when and when black lives are taken in my neighborhood by other black people, they don't care. No. They don't show up because those black lives don't further their agenda. So they don't give a crap. So we have to deal with that. They don't deal with it. We don't see them here ever, ever, unless they want to burn down a building. It was a powerful moment. Tell, tell, told to, by a person who lived it. Who li you know, I'm a, you know, the truth is I'm a voyeur. I agree. I, I, I flit in, I flit out. I understand. I don't live there, right? I don't deal with the consequences. This guy lives with the consequences of what he saw. And, and he's in the video. He's in one of he, the absolutely. videos. Absolutely. Yeah, he's one of the most, most pivotal, one of the pivotal parts of the video. Uh, yeah. Now, tell me, you did spend time with one of the founders of Black Lives Matter. Yeah, a woman named Melina Abdullah. Melina Abdullah, who, who is head of Black Lives Matter Los Angeles, Correct. which is and one, one of the, the original biggest organizers of Black original Lives Matter. Original organizers. National. And did she, was it your video in which she talks about uh, Marxism, that, uh, that she is a dedicated Marxist, or was that something no, else? No, so, so it was in the video, but she actually made up an interesting point, which was okay, the organization itself is Marxist based, and they will tell you. And the other three, the other founders will say we're Marxist. Now she personally does identify as Marxism for a very interesting reason, not the one that one way might think. She's identified with all the economic principles of Marxism, mm -hmm. totally against free market capitalism, want a totally controlled economic system. I agree with every single principle. The reason why I don't personally ascribe myself as being a Marxist because I happen to be a spiritual person and Marxism is devoid of spirituality. In fact, it's anti-spirituality, anti-religion. So she said, because I have, I believe in God, I don't consider myself a Marxist. But outside of that, every other principle, I'm there for it. I sign I up for it. Yeah, and, and she is in favor of destroying the American system. 100%. I mean, she said it over and over again to me. Again, this is, this is them saying the quiet part out loud. This is... Them, remember, everybody says, oh, no, no, they don't believe it. They don't want to destroy all the systems. They want to destroy all the systems, Ju judicial, uh, economic, political, burn it literally and figuratively, burn it all down. And they said it over and over again. And <clears throat> what do you think is the end result? 
if they do that. It's uh, I believe that the well, go ahead, tell me what you, you think they the accomplish end is. Their, yeah, if they their accomplish that. What's going to happen goals? next? Yeah. And they defund the police. There's no police. There's lawlessness. There's huge civil unrest in America. And that's it. What happens that, next? That's it. That's what happens. Yeah, but what happens after that? Oh, well, they, the, what they, the, by the way, they know that will happen. Yes. Like this, this is, that's not a bug in the system. That's the point of that's what, they what they're driving towards. Yeah, that's the point. They want the, they want the chaos. Mm-hmm. They want the civil unrest because what they want is they want to be able to. They know they can't recreate the country in their own image as the country is alive and well and breathing. They can only recreate it when it's burned down. From ashes. And, and right. That's the, that's when they can they can do push their agenda and and make sure that they can recreate this country. So in the own goal is image. to destroy it and then they take charge. Correct. Right. And then there will be police. It'll be their police. Oh, you better believe it. Be you police. better believe it. The brown the, the brown shirts will, will be, be out there. Right. There'll be police. No defunding that. Nope. Mm-hmm. I mean, look, just all you got to do is look at history. Look at every single revolution we've seen. Russian Revolution, French Revolution. I mean, what happened after the revolution? You mm-hmm. had nothing but chaos, instability, and death. Right. And then people beg for someone to take control, and they think they're going to be the ones who And then take you get control. right. And then when the, in the French Revolution, you end up with, 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 um, with a dictator. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But the, you get, you end, when you, after you have the revolution... You then have the guillotine. Yep. It, it, it looks bad. Ami, it looks bad. And your videos, especially these videos uh, about uh, immediate contemporary issues, uh, are so important. And I'm so happy to, to see that they're getting a lot of uh, viewership. Well, my fans are going to be really excited about this video because they always say, who's Dr. Bob? <laughs> Who's, you don't know. Cause remember, the, the videos end with "Thank you, Doctor Bob," and they always are like, "They Who's don't that? know which." Doctor well, they do Bob now. I mean, they, you know. now they're going to know which Doctor Bob <laughs> supports many of these videos. Now, directly related to Black Lives Matter is white privilege, of course, and uh, I think, as I recall, I didn't see the video recently, but you went. I think it was to uh, was it in Portland? It was in Kansas City. Can, okay, Kansas City. There was a, 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 there was a. A whole conference on Wait, white privilege. Could you imagine that? A conference. When I saw, when I saw, I can't remember where I saw. I was like, I gotta go. A white privilege conference. A conference. I, but the but the worst part is it was it was populated by educators, high school teachers, elementary school teachers. That was the audience. It wasn't just random people. Oh, it was meant for educators. That makes it even worse. Oh, way worse. So tell us about those interviews and tell us about the the lectures that you might have sat through. So a lot of times when I come up with a concept for a video, the first thing I think is, there's no way this is going to work. There's no way they're going to believe that, right? Impossible. There's no way I can go to Yale and have people sign a petition to repeal the First Amendment. That's going too far. Then I learned that the left never disappoints. So I went there to see how far I could push these people in terms of white privilege. And there just, there was no, there is no, you can't push them far enough. There is no far enough for them. They would agree with all of it. Essentially, that what their point was is that um, if you're a white person, you have it all handed to you. It's all handed to you. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know you, Doctor Bob. It was all handed to you. Oh, yeah, sure. everything you had was you with a <laughs> silver platter. You had to work for nothing. Yeah, yeah. Like Obama said, you didn't build that. You didn't do anything. No. It was all given to you by the government. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, I I recently watched the video, and in the video. You ask each one of them, can you give me an example? You're white. These are all white people there, matter of fact, right? To, 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 to lecture each, other's, each, each other on white privilege. You ask them, can you give me an example in your life about white privilege? And not one of them Fumble, said Fumble. Uh, uh, <laughs> the fact that I'm walking out here now. Or, or, well, nothing happened to me today. But the fact that nothing happened to me today is, is an example privilege. of white privilege. I mean, it's, it's nonsense. It is absolute gobbledygook. Um, but again, the, the other side of that video, and, and again, the, the, what they kept emphasizing was that black people basically can't get out of bed mm-hmm. because of white privilege. Like they can't, they don't, they don't want to, they don't want to mo- do anything because they know the deck They're is stacked lose. against They're them. They're going to lose because the game is rigged. That was their entire point, right? Right. So their of course, entire point. But but yet we had a black president for eight years, for two terms, and, and he appointed a black attorney general. So uh, how is it that you can't get out of bed because of white privilege, privilege but yet you can have a black do you know president? Who, okay, so these white people don't understand that. Do you know who does understand that? Black people. 
right? So when I went to Harlem again to meet my buddies mm -hmm. and say, well, what about white privilege? They go, well, what, what about it? I said, well, how do you function? What do you mean? I, I get up, I, I go to work, I, I educate my kids, I come home, I take care of my kids. What do you mean? Well, how do I function? They look at me like I have two heads. What are you talking about? These people, they're so disconnected from the black community. It's, 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 it's No, they're grotesque. connected with reality. They're not connected with, uh, with the left. No, no, I'm saying the left is so disconnected from the people they purport to protect. Right, to protect. Right? right? And represent. In fact, I remember, I remember one guy looked at me and he says, you know, my wife is black. I go, congratulations. And he goes, when I go to the airport, now she, I goes, oh, so she's hassled. Well, there's a white guy. White guy. Okay. I go, so when you go to the airport, you see the, you see the security hassle your wife? He goes, no, no, because I bestow my white privilege onto my wife. This is what he literally would tell me. I said, this guy, <laughs> serious. This guy for real? Now he, there's an actual, he sees, this is not hidden camera. He sees the camera. Yeah. And he has the audacity to say that, the stupidity on camera to say that. Probably talk about, talk about Messiah uh, uh, complex. complex. Yeah. I mm. bestow my white privilege onto her. Onto her. So she's protected. Correct. And if he wasn't there, she would have been attacked. Oh, my God. Attacked, She'd be attacked. Raped, 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 whatever. Right, right. Yeah, right. of course. Never, never allowed on a plane. Of course. Ooh, one of the things I admire about you most, there are many things. Aside from my sexiness. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's another story, Ali. Yeah, you could dress a little different. <laughs> no, but uh, one of the things that uh, really stands out is your ability to not get angry at these people. They're telling you such nonsense, such bullshit, that uh, he bestows his whiteness onto it. And you didn't say, you're a fucking nut. You didn't, yeah, and you, you keep on going because you're a professional. And you're able to hide or, or keep your emotions in clearly in check because you are an emotional guy you'd love to strangle somebody for saying that wouldn't you 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 hit it. my greatest skill set yeah. my greatest skill set is not throttling the yeah. person i'm talking to right. it is very difficult it is really you hit upon something mm -hmm. that i rarely ever talk about it is extremely difficult it's rare. To keep. like uh, you said I, i'm an emotional i'm a very emotional guy yeah. uh and it is it is i have to really bite my tongue mm -hmm. literally and figuratively um, mm -hmm. the stupidity mm -hmm. I have to face on a daily basis is astonishing. Because every one of your videos deals with an issue where, where these people are so out of touch with what is accurately factual that, that it, it's just upsetting. You know, and and then it's not like they've been on a, a, on a different planet. They've been to schools, but maybe that's the problem. They've been miseducated. It, it wouldn't be so... Um, it wouldn't be so terrible if um, these people were had no influence, had no relevance, right? Um, so let's say I did this video 20 years ago. It wouldn't matter as much because they're just a bunch of kooks. Mm. The problem is that their perspective uh, is now being echoed and parroted in the in halls the of Congress. Right. Oh, no, right. Yes, in the media. Well, and... Where's the media that you're going to say in the halls of Congress? Yeah, uh, some of our some of our Congress people. So I'll say, look, I don't believe the media is hard left. Uh, I think the media is a problem because they don't understand what the hard left is about, so they give them passes. I, if you ask me, do I think that member if you name members of the media, even people in MSNBC, do I think they're members of the hard left? I don't. Um, but they do not understand who these people are. They do not understand their agenda. The gender we talked about, the destruction of the state of the United, of the United States. Destroying American and culture. And they will make excuses for the most radical. They'll make excuses for Ilan Omar and AOC and Rashida Tlaib, right? So they carry their water kind of unknowingly, to be honest. Oh, that's too kind. I think I they're know, evil. I yeah. think they're evil. I think they're, they, they believe the same things that those radicals believe. And they got those jobs with the sole intention of proselytizing those beliefs, of spreading those beliefs. But these people are in positions of power. They are. They are professors the educating our children. They are in the halls of Congress and in the Senate. Uh, one could argue they might have been in the White House. Might still be in the White House. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we can we can debate Joe Biden all, all day long, but look, Joe Biden, at the end of the day, is he a hard leftist? I don't think he is. I don't, I don't think he's hard anything. He's soft. Soft he's, in the head. That's exactly right. <laughs> So he's been co-opted yeah, no, by puppet. the hard left he's because his agenda right. mirrors them, right. right? Mirrors them. 
at least been told. Yeah. If you look into his history, he was a segregationist at one point, actually. He spoke out against blacks, against, uh, you know, against uh, integrated schools. I did one, schools. one of my most successful videos was when I went out to again, Harlem. There's a, there's a trend here. And um, I asked them, uh, who said this comment? And they had to guess who said it. And that, how racist is the comment? And they're like, that's a 10. That's a 10. That's a 10. So you know who said that? They go, who? Joe Biden. They go, what? Mm -hmm. They couldn't believe it. Uncle Joe? Right? They call him Uncle Joe. Right, because he was Obama's vice president. You know, he, he was he were he was the vice president of the first black president in the history of the United States. Uncle Joe said that they were unbelievably shocked. But they but ev when they when I gave them the the, the quote blind, yes. not knowing who said, they said it, it's racist. They I get one out of ten. Ten, 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 ten. I got what is that? That's the most racist thing I've ever heard. Right, but now he's on the other side because uh, he's being controlled. I don't think he has any particular views on anything anymore. But unfortunately, the people in, ch in charge have these views that we're so upset about now that are uh, inappropriate, inaccurate, and just flawed with the main goal of destroying our country, destroying it, look, our it, country. It, I know a lot of people are taking schadenfreude um, on the, the fights between the Democrat, the in inter-party fighting the Democratic Party. And to some extent, I suffer from that too. I enjoy watching it. I don't like enjoying yeah. watching it, but if I'm being honest, I do. But... It is not good to have that. You do not want the Democratic Party to fall into uh, into nothingness or into the heart, become the hard. Even though politically it might be advantageous to us in the short term, in the long term, this country needs two strong parties who can balance each other. I don't think we're I don't think we're healthy if well, we only have the right in power, and and I don't think we're healthy if we only have the left in power. I think that that push and pull. Uh, I think ends up working. For, I think the system is well, set up the way think that it works. Well, I think that has been true in the past because no matter what party it was, they all loved America. Right. All right? John F. Kennedy, a, a strong Democrat. If he were out live today, he wouldn't be a Democrat. No. You know, his, his views then are, are clearly Republican views today. So in the past, we had differences on, on the economy, differences on education, lots of differences between uh, the uh, Democrats and Republicans. And how to get but, to it, but yeah, the end goal but was the same, a stronger the end goal, America. The goal was make America better, not burn America down and make it different. Not in Obama's own words that in the next two weeks, we are going to start the f to fundamentally change the United States of America. That's what he said before he took the oath of office. He was goal-oriented, as he still is today, to fundamentally change the United States of America. And the um, United States of America doesn't need fundamental change. In all the countries of the world, more people are trying to get in here than anywhere else. Nobody's trying to get out of America. You don't hear about people building a raft I, I, in, I in wish, Florida going the other way. I wish some of these people would want to get out of America. Right. So if America is so fundamentally flawed, why is it that everyone in the world wants to be here? So they understand, but they these immigrants, whether they're legal or illegal, don't see what's happening, that the America that they were, are trying to get into doesn't exist anymore and is, is failing right now. We are circling the drain. Freedom every day. Our freedoms are being eaten away like rust on iron every day. And it's happening. You know, it's uh, the old story is how do you boil a frog? You put them in a pot of water and you turn up the heat slowly so that every day, you know, okay, we'll put up with this. We'll wear a mask. We'll get an injection. And every day you're giving in. You're, you're, you're. Your, your soul is being taken taken from you. I would like to disagree with you, but I can't. Yeah, I wish, I wish you could. I wish somebody could make an argument that, uh, that there's light uh, at the end of this tunnel. But right now, it, it, it looks very bad. The way we left Afghanistan, for example, that wasn't by accident. People say, well, they made mistakes. No, no, no. They left the money there. And they left the weapons there. Billions of dollars of weapons were left there. They could have many, been taken many out. Many billion, over many eight, eighty billion, right, of left there. They, nobody was forcing us out. It wasn't like Vietnam, where it, it appeared that you know that we lost the war and we were being forced out. Not here. We weren't being forced out. Biden or the people who control Biden made the decision to get out and leave all that behind. Why? Because the people in charge right now of America hate America, 
and they are leaving those things behind, these assets of war and money, to people who hate America. So I, look, I think I think it was more incompetence than anything else. I think it was an it to, it was incompetence. You have you know some good decisions, some bad decisions. I don't believe that. I believe it's thoughtful. It's it's intentional. And and America's standing on the world stage now is diminished every day. If you talk to, if you talk to diplomats as what I do, you, no, Biden said he's bringing back American prestige. He said it. I heard him. Right. He said it. So you can't be right. Can't be. The president can't, said it. Can't be right. America's be back, right. baby. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wish that were true. Look, I'll get. Look, here's okay. Here, I can't prognosticate the future, but I can look at the past, maybe apply it to the future, and I'd like to think. I could be wrong. We had this the, the the social dislocation and the social unrest of the '60s led to the destruction of our country in the '70s. Right, the '70s this country was in the garbage. We had a decade of no growth and 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 crime. And what did that lead to? Ronald Reagan. Mm-hmm. I'd like to now, now keep in mind that was 10, 12 years, maybe fifteen years of suffering. And maybe that's what we're going to, that's, that's the, uh, the era we're going to be entering into. Mm-hmm. But hopefully in the long term, I, I have unlimited amounts of confidence in the American people. And that I'd like to think that they're now realizing that this is leading to the destruction of this country. And that maybe it will take 10 years of pain and then we'll have another Ronald Reagan. Well, it's like, it's all simple. That would take an election. Now, here's why I think that's not going to happen. I think elections can happen. But the demographics are against uh, positive things happening in this country, are against the Republicans winning. Every day, more and more people, more and more kids are graduating high school, college, where they've been indoctrinated into leftism. You talk to them. Those are the people you're talking to on a daily basis in these interviews. And they're not waking up. Those people are going to go to the polls and they're going to vote for the left. They truly believe that socialism is better. They have no idea. They've never been to Venezuela. They've never been to Cuba. They've never been to Haiti. They've never been outside of the United States probably except uh, to Cancun on a vacation or something to, like to, that. To, to party, yeah, yeah, to party yeah. and to drink party, themselves to, to party and to get stoned. So the demographics are against us. In ad- adding to that, adding to the fact that everyone who's graduating high school and college today, or the vast majority, are going to be leftists, adding to that are the illegal immigrants who are coming in from some of the worst, the most impoverished countries in the world. They're coming in with diseases. They're coming in with lack of understanding of law and order. They're coming in for a handout, which this administration is going to give them. And those people which is, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands a day are coming over the border, they're going to get to vote because the, every st- states like California will, who don't require voter ID won't even require you be a citizen to vote in this country. That's where we're headed. So I don't see any way of winning at the ballot box. So I think that actually the long-term demographics are for us. And I'll tell you why. Everything you said is true about about the illegal immigrants, about um, about professors. But the truth is that if you look into the numbers, what you find, particularly among the Hispanic population, right, is that after the first generation who was there to, to get, like there to get a handout, that their f- generations after that start trending Republican. Because they are, first of all, they're coming from, yes, they're coming from countries that have low law and order, socialism, if not communism. They're running away for a reason. They understand the evils of those regimes. And if you look at, uh, look, if you just look at Texas, you look at the Texas demographics, Hispanic demographics, they're trending, the, 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 genera- the older generations or the second, third generations are trending Republican. The first generations don't. And that's having an electoral disadvantage for Republicans. But longer term, I think that the Democrats have made a massive blunder, a massive miscalculation. These are conservative people from conservative cultures. They're Catholics. Um, and I, no, I, 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 I don't follow you. People from Haiti uh, have basically— so I'm talking, I'm talking Hispan- Hispanic population. Oh, the Hispanics, you might very well be right. You're right. Uh, you're very and frankly, right I think them. the black population is waiting, waking up. I mm-hmm. think you're seeing them trend. It's sh- 
sure, you know, slowly but surely, trending away in a lot of ways from the Democratic Party because of the things that I've mm-hmm. exposed, pointed out. Yeah, um, the Jews. I think we have. I don't. I think we have nothing. We're not. We're not. We're not, we're not going to win that. We're not going to figure one. that one no. out, Ami. Right. But um, look, I'm a short-term pessimist or long-term optimist. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that this country will wake up if they aren't already waking up to the danger of the left. I think there's going to be a reaction against it. Well, hopefully we'll see that in the 2022 elections. If we don't win back the House and the Senate, every single person running those races should need to be fired. Mm-hmm. If we don't win back, I mean, what they've done in this country, if, right. if the people running these races don't take back the House and the Senate. Given how, how poor the economy is doing. I mean, uh, everything. You know, That's the economy. Yeah, you read. You know, you, you can read the Wall Street Journal about inflation is a two or three percent. That's nonsense. Everybody I speak to, who you know, you go to Costco, you go to Ralph's, everything you're buying is thirty percent more. So I don't know who is calculating the inflation. They always numbers, do the. But, they say the core inflation rate, which takes out food and energy prices. Oh yeah. So vol- <laughs> what, what, do you, what do you think people spend most of their money on? Uh, yeah. Dummy. Yeah. yeah. Food and energy. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's always been that way. Core inflation. It's core, it's core, it's core. Everything else is fl- fluctuating. Well, yeah, fluctuate. That's why you have to take it into account. Uh, no, this, this is, we are, yes, the, the, the ship is sinking. No question about it. I think we can plug the holes. And I think we can rebuild the ship. Well, we should be able to, win, the, uh, the Republicans should be able to win houses and Senate seats in 2022 it, it, based it, on uh, what with the average person's take-home pay and, yes, and, and yes, where it's going. Yes, 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 yes. Right. Look, I, I, if you want, again, if you want a more of a positive spin on this, I think Biden's presidency is done, done. I think he's he's pushing. He's got just he's only got a year. His major agenda pieces are being stifled. I don't think they're getting through. Um, and then once they're in, in in once there's a turnover in the House and the Senate, he's not going to be able to pass anything. Mm-hmm. Um, They'll be fortunate for for our country. Let's talk a bit about anti-Semitism now. Uh, it's been around a long time. Probably the the longest type of. Uh, of hatred in this world has been hatred of the Jews. And uh, uh, you've done a couple videos about this. One is where you went to uh, Berkeley, the University of California at Berkeley, with two flags. One was an ISIS flag, a big ISIS flag on a big pole, and the other was an Israeli flag, similarly large. Tell us what you discovered. So these are one of those examples where I, when I, when I was sitting in my living room drinking scotch, Thinking about this concept, I thought, come on, this is not going to work, right? I mean, nobody's going to support the ISIS flag, right? So the video and, was— And this was done when when ISIS was a real enemy. Yeah, this is, ISIS was all in the news. It was all in the news. ISIS. Behead, they were beheading journalists. They, they had killed Daniel Pearl. Correct. Uh, it was on the news, the war against ISIS. It was the forefront of everybody's right. minds. Right, And again, the idea is to do it with hidden cameras, so we get the real reaction from people. And we had a couple of hidden cameras— and uh, on the first part, I was waving the ISIS flag. And I wasn't just waving the ISIS flag. I was saying, I am ISIS. Let's and kill them. And you did him. it on the stairs of a, there was a huge it's building. It's called the Campanile. The it's like one yeah. of the major, uh, major, one of the most popular spots in all of Berkeley. Right, and, and it's a stone structure with, you know, with steps going up, and you were in the middle of those steps, high up. Right. Hundreds and hundreds of people were passing by me. Right. I didn't get a single... Person and not only did you wave back. the flag, you were saying stuff. Let's kill Americans, fight for ISIS, destroy America. I mean, I couldn't have been clearer <laughs> on my intent, right? <laughs> and uh, this is again, this is Berkeley, California. This is the this is a pretty damn good school, right? Mm-hmm. UC Ber- I couldn't get into UC Berkeley. I, right. I, I wasn't smart enough to get there. Mm-hmm. Um, and I didn't get a single person who pushed back on me. In fact, I got people who supported me, professors, students. I love what you're doing. Keep it up. And um, and then afterwards, okay, so then I thought to myself, okay, well, this is Berkeley. They're used to kooks. I don't know. Maybe they're just like some crazy guy at the stairs waving an ISIS flag. I'll, you know, I'll just blow it off. Maybe. Yeah, there were some people supporting me, but okay, that's possible. Let's prove it. Let's see if it's true or not true. So then I ne- the next day, I went with the Israeli flag. Same place. Slightly different place. Okay. I wanted to be somewhere a little bit different, a little bit different background you know, steps away from the place. And uh, was flying the Israeli flag, saying th- just things like, I love Israel. Israel's a wonderful dem- democracy. That's really kind of milk toast things, right? Nothing provocative. Within seconds, the vitriol 
was flowing down all over me. Anti-Semitic vitriol. Not just, not just anti-Israel. Anti-Semitic. Now, anybody who tells you... Now, look. You're allowed to criticize Israel and not be an anti-Semite. Tell, I criticize Israel. You've criticized Israel. No country is above criticism. Not this country, not Israel, not any country. But there is a point where you cross over from legitimate criticism to anti-Semitism. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And to me, the reason why I think if you are a supporter of BDS, you're an anti-Semite is because you're not calling for the boycotting of, I don't know, North Korea, China, Venezuela. Iran, Cuba. Venezuela, Cuba, go on and on. Yeah. Now, if you did, I would say, okay, you're, you're an idiot, you're mm-hmm. a fool. To, to lump Israel in with, with those, those countries. But countries, okay, but, but at least you are consistent, right? Right. In, in criticizing the, all the bad countries. Mm-hmm. But they don't do that. They criticize Only. the one Jewish state that exists in the world. So to me, that's when you are anti-Semite. Proof. But I didn't have to, this, I don't need sophistry to say why these people were anti-Semitic because they were yelling at me, I saw you with your, with your shitty Star of David. I mean, this is what they were saying to me. So, yeah, it was, it was, and look, it's the reason why that video did 25, 30 million views because it shocked the consciousness of people. Um, and it's a, it's a video that, you know, I, I think most Jews in the world have seen at this point, actually. Uh, it is really a, in fact, it was so powerful that a couple of years, I rarely ever repeat videos, but once in a while I will if it's important enough. And I repeated that video, but I changed it up to, to use an American flag. Same, same concept. A couple years later, ISIS was back in the news. In fact, they had just committed a terrorist attack in New York where they killed a number of people. So I was like, okay, this is, this is an opportunity. It's back in the news. And I went back with the ISIS flag. Come kill Americans. Destroy America. Support, support, support. And then the next day, I flew the American flag. The sa- What do you know? The same disgusting vitriol I got from the Israeli flag, I got the American flag. You idiot. You piece of shit. This flag stands for disgustingness. This is, you are disgusting. It was amazing. Absolutely amazing. And this is on the campus of one of the top colleges in America. Like you said before, the, 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 the pessimistic part of me says, yeah, these, we are, these are the leaders we're producing, right? You said it. These are the people who are going to be in the halls of Congress, the CEOs of companies, right? And you're right. I can't disagree with you. That. And from that perspective, we have a massive problem, massive problem. And this is exemplary of that. I mean, I've done this in your, I've, I've, I've done videos like this around the country at Yale, at Harvard, right? And I've gotten the same response. This is where I am pessimistic and worried. These are future voters and future. Forget the future voters. Future, future politicians. Leaders, leaders. Future leaders. These are the leaders. Economic leaders, political leaders, social leaders. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. From the, now, the again, I like to be optimistic. I like to think that when when reality hits them, that many of them will say, "Oh, that was that was a stupid time in my life." Mm. I don't really believe that now. I don't know that. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know that. Um, you know. Continue in the same theme. You've done videos uh, to support Hamas, raising money for Hamas. You know, just when you say it, it sounds so stupid. <laughs> yeah, who's going to say yes to Who, that? Like, what kind of dumb concept yeah, is that? Yeah, Hamas, like, which is, I think many countries have uh, uh, denoted it as a terrorist organization. Even dumb countries have denoted it as a yeah, terrorist but, uh, organization. And I think even the United States uh, has uh, has labeled it a terrorist organization. Oh, absolutely. Organization. No, U.S., I'm saying one of the smart countries. I mean, dumb right. countries like dumb. Europe. Yeah. Have, have, They've have, also have re- right. realized yeah. they're in their stupid in their stupidity. They have come, at least they know the Hamas is a terrorist organization that blows up buses right. and hospitals and schools. So yeah, um, I went. So let's raise money for them. Why not? Yeah, but they're, they're, come on, Doctor Bob. Nobody's gonna give you money to raise money to kill Jews, right? Except they did. Mm-hmm. And you made it clear. You you were saying this is not your grandfather's Hamas, the, uh, grandfather's terrorist. This is modern day terrorism, right? And you talk about we're going. I'm raising money for this organization, and we're going to target soft targets around the world where Jews go. It's either going synagogues, to be, right, schools, soft hospitals. And what do you think? Will you help us? And what happened? People were in absolute support. First of all, I want to make one thing clear. So again, to make you know. Like I said before, you know, 
what you see on screen is what the preponderance of people react, how they reacted to it. In those communities, of course. The, they, of course. You know, yeah. No, no, it's self selecting it, because right. I'm. Because of course, I'm, of course. This is not about uh, you know a, a left of center Democrat. Of course, mm. None of them will support that. Yeah, right. This is the, I'm I am trying to show the the, the crazies. Yeah, who are but, leading? But, who are right, leading the uh, the discussion? Correct. Leading That's the why when you say crazy, I want to make sure that yeah. this is not outliers. These are not people who have no relevance. This is a relevant section of the left, mm. right? Um, and I went again to a university where you would think these are educated people. Again, I want to denote there's no connection to education and wisdom. Zero. In fact, there might be an inverse connection, frankly. Um, and I was saying all the things again to be specific, not just raise money for Hamas. I don't know, maybe they don't know who Hamas is, right? to kill Jews and to blow up schools and hospitals and these people not just supported me, giving me money, money. I can go to beer pong. Instead of yeah. going up to kill Jews. Mm -hmm. I know it's funny, you know, it's, uh, but it's, it is, this, I mean, this is, this is sad. This is sad stuff. This is horrible, sad stuff. Now, okay, I raised money for Hamas. But there's no way I could raise money for the Taliban, right? No, the to Taliban are horrible. They're bad, they right? They stone women. They stone right? women, right? We know that, right? They pull them out of schools. No more schools know that, for women right? in Afghanistan. We know that, right? Right. It's on the news today. And I mean, okay, you hate Israel and Jews. You're an anti-Semite, fine. But you live in you're an American. You live in America, and, and and you believe in women's rights, don't you? Right. So okay, so that's not going to work, right? No, I, I would think that you couldn't get anyone to support. Let's leave it at the that. Taliban. Let's leave it at that for now. Okay. Well, we're raising money for the Taliban. We're raising money for the Taliban here. Uh, train them how to use weapons again. All the weapons that the U.S. left. Your team is really important, and I agree with you fully. I guess we're going to see what that video tells us uh, about the Taliban and about the educated section of the uh, of the left in America, uh, the supposedly educated section. Okay, so which uh, which of the videos uh, of your videos are you proudest of? Like Sophie's Choice, man. Yeah, I know. There's so many this. good ones, right? Is, you know, oh. oh, which one? Which so video think... may... You know, it's... I, I, I'm thrilled about these videos because they show in black and white how stupid and, and how uneducated or how vicious the left is. And, da and how dangerous. dangerous they are, okay? But can we affect things? Which <clears throat> which one of your videos or which videos do you think are the most effective at, at turning... It turning the tide. We're not going to convince the people who are in your video who are saying that blacks can't uh, 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 can't get a can find a place to get an ID. We're not going to. These uh, videos are not them. about targeting the people that I'm targeting. Mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. It's not about convincing them. They're they're a lost generation. Lost. We'll never yeah. convince them. But what I look to do, and um, I spend a lot of time with data, a lot of time with data, um, on how this affects people. Because uh, I do focus groups, and I, we spend a lot of time and money on trying to understand what the impact is. We're we're looking at people who consider themselves to be left of center, yeah, yet have a sympathy for um, for some of these views. They would say, "Okay, look, I'm not, I don't support Israel, and I get why they do BDS." So the reason, so I, I'm looking to convince them to say, "Look, almost like a dark mirror. Here's what you look like." And they look at me, and again, I've done focus groups. They go, "That's ugly. That's me. I don't want that's that's not what I'm looking to be. I don't want. I'm not that guy. And I think that's ugly. I think it's damaging. And I think we have to ostracize that viewpoint. That's the point. So, okay, there are a number of ways how you can assess impact. So there are a couple of ways, and the the I can point a couple of particular examples which uh, show obvious impact. And the one that I'm pro one of the things I'm most proud of, I think there's two that I'm most proud of. One was a video where I went to Sweden. And I went to Sweden because there, there were people who were saying no-go zones, which are basically areas where there's a, it's almost an Islamic fiefdom, an enclave, where white people can enter. Uh, government services, can the police, fire department cannot enter. And the left was saying, not, not the hard left, I mean like left of center, the, the, the media enterprise around the world was saying, it's a fiction of right-wing conspirators. Mm -hmm. That doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Not a thing. I said, well, I don't know. Seems easy enough to prove. Let's go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's find out. 
So I went to Sweden. Sweden. I mean, you know, the Swedes. They can't have that in Sweden. And what I found out, uh, much to my body's chagrin, when I got pummeled by uh, five Islamic immigrants to Sweden, was that they, in fact, do exist in a very real and tangible way. But more than that, it was about what unfettered Islamic immigration can do to a culture. And so, if you guys remember, going back to uh, the conflict in Syria, uh, hundreds of thousands of Islamists, uh, well, Islamic immigrants, mm-hmm. not all of them were Islamists, were fleeing the country, which I, I get, and wanted to go somewhere safe. And they were all, they went in large part to Europe. Mm-hmm. Germany, uh, France, England, but what most people don't know the as a percentage of a country, Sweden took in the most. Mm. Mm-hmm. And um, one thing I want to make clear about something: these people weren't going from Syria into Sweden or Germany; they were going from Turkey. Right. They all went to Turkey, which borders Syria, and they were safe. Mm-hmm. Now they're safe. Now what they're looking for is an upgraded lifestyle. Which, by the way, if Anybody who's trying to come into this country, Europe, I don't begrudge it in the sense that I would do the same thing. That's the right reason. No, as Doesn't a, mean as a we person should who lives, everybody in. Correct. As a right. person who lives in a sovereign country, right. I have the you have the right to try to get in here, mm-hmm. and I have the right, living in a sovereign country with sovereign laws, to say, no, there's a process mm-hmm. you have to go through. Now, they didn't go through any process to get into these countries. They just let them in wholesale. And once they were in Europe, because of the Schengen... They can go anywhere they, they want. They can go anywhere they want. So a lot of them settled in Sweden. And what you happened, you what you saw demonstrably, was a rise. If you looked at the the charts of the the rise in pop of Islamic population in Sweden and the rise in rape and murder in Sweden went up the same exact way. Now I'm touching a raw nerve. I get that. People were not happy about touching that raw nerve. But this video became, you know, it, it's hard to understate how big this video became. So. I'll walk you through the story because it's worthwhile. The video came out, I think on a Friday. And, you know, I went to sleep. Next morning I wake up and President Trump gave a speech about the video. And he, in in Trumpian terms, he misspoke. The man is prone to do that. And he said, look what happened last night in Sweden. Now, what he meant to say was, I saw a video last night. Look what's happening in Sweden. doesn't matter, right? The world exploded. What do you mean? What happened last? And then he became a meme. What yes. happened last night in Sweden? It was a whole thing. What happened last night in Sweden? And it was all over the news. By Sunday morning, they realized what happened. He was, they realized they were referring to my video and my wife wakes me up. She goes, you're on the front page of the New York Times. Turns out I wasn't the front page of the New York Times. The front page of every newspaper on planet Earth. That's not over exaggeration. I mean like Hindustan Times, Der Spiegel, LA Times, mm-hmm. the Sydney Herald. Was it because uh, President Trump misspoke or because... No, now we've moved on from the misspoking right. to the actual video, the core of the video wow. itself. great. Uh, to give you a sense of how big this video was, for 24 hours, the first 15 minutes of every hour on CNN, the first, of every single hour was video creates global controversy. Okay. It was so big that Jimmy Kimmel, who was hosting the Oscars a couple weeks later, made a joke about the video on the Oscars. That's how big the video was. Um, now, so you have a number of ways you can have impact, right? So this video is a perfect example. So the most obvious way is the amount of people who saw the video and now have taken in what you've said. And that video did, I don't know, probably 17, 18 million views. So just in terms of viewership, it had impact. The second level of impact sure. is... People the controversy TV it or, creates. Right. So now it's being discussed in every newspaper on the planet. Right. So everyone in the world is now at least entering, interested, uh, interested in the topic. In the issue. They may disagree. They may agree. Right. But now they're at least debating mm. and discussing mm. it. And the third level impact, which is the one I'm actually most proud of, was after this video came out. Was, I mean, as big as it was globally, you can't, you can't overstate the impact it had in Sweden itself. I mean, it was, to this day, it has impact. To this day. I was, I, I, went to, I was in a bar in Norway about a, I don't know, a year and a half ago, you know, several years after the video came out, and I was tossed out of the bar because people were pointing me and chanting racist, racist, racist. In Norway, not even in Sweden, that it was so in the forefront of their minds that they recognized me in a bar years later and they tossed me out. 
because you produced a video which accurately stated the conditions Correct. in Sweden. So the, the, the ultimate impact that video was Sweden changed its policy a, as a direct result of the controversy of the video. And they stopped their wholesale uh, allowance of Islamic immigrants at the country. A little late. It was a, it was a little better late than never, mm-hmm, right? Because mm-hmm. th- th- the people, I, some people in Sweden, I was interviewing, they said, we don't care what the number is. Bring them all in. I remember that. So there's no limit. There's no limit. That's what they were right. saying. We have we have enough room. There's no limit. So so yes, I wouldn't say it was too little, too late. It was definitely too little and a little bit late, mm-hmm. but not too late no. because you, you know we, at some point you got to stop it. Right. So that's an example of of impact. Uh, in one other example, I, I, I could spend all day talking that's, about the impact of videos. That's a fantastic example, Ani. And I remember you interviewed uh, uh, two policemen on that video, uh, and they said that. Uh, they're not even supposed to report it by race anymore. No, they've stopped. They've they've stopped right. reporting by race. Yeah, if there's a rape, you can't say by whom. They yeah, say right. that they were chasing them. If they were chasing, if they were hot pursuit, this is they on camera. Yeah. If they were hot pursuit, they would have to stop. Now the controversy, the video. You know, I don't mind talking about the controversy. The controversy or a controversy was those two policemen reneged on what they said. Now they said oh, on camera. Yeah. Yeah. But they, they, and, and I said, well, they forced you to keep their job. They, they, the so. pressure they were under, like, I have to hold it against them. I yeah. mean, no, of course. The pressure they under was, ma- I mean, they were going to lose their jobs. Massive pressure. So they had to, they, you know, they had no choice. Didn't, I mean, but you didn't have a gun to their head. No, this is all, this is not on camera. Right. <laughs> Out of You're context, just watch the guy. camera. You didn't have them locked up in a no, room. No, it's, right. it's, 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 it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. Well, that was one, ex- one uh, video where you actually, had physical violence uh, upon yourself, right? Who would have thought? Out of all the places I've gone to, Hezbollah, in, yeah, in the yeah, Bekaa yeah, Valley, yeah, yeah. In the refugee camps, Janine, where did I get beat up? Stockholm. Sweden. Yeah, Stockholm. Who would have thought? Is that the only example of where you... I know you've been threatened I've, many times, no, of course. Uh, yeah, no, the only other time where I was physically hurt mm-hmm. was at a in, in Portland. Again, of all the dangerous places I've been to, Portland... People recognized me, and they were throwing glass shards at me because what they're doing is they're throwing incendiary devices, mostly Molotov cocktails, at a uh, at a courthouse, right? Yeah. Because of course, I'd bring it down. They don't actually want to destroy the judicial system. They're just trying to throw Molotov cocktails yeah. at a courthouse. How symbolic is that? So they would pick up the shards of glass and they were throwing at me. So I was cut up a little bit by the shards of glass. Yeah, nothing, nothing, nothing compared. Nothing to the I can't. Nothing I can't handle. But nothing compared to the no, beating. No, it was nothing compared to that beating. In, in I, yeah, I got I got tuned up pretty good in, in Stockholm. Well, you know, there are drivers of your success. It's uh, and. and one of them is clearly boldness. You you have balls on me. You go where no one else would go, and you ask the questions that no one else dares to ask. Right, and and you're a public figure. People know who you are now. So, uh, uh, you know, I worry about your safety. And as as you know, I've I've, I've often um, uh, uh, counseled you to to bring uh, uh, protection with you, bodyguards, and I think you have to you have to do that. Especially now. Your counsel had impact because I do. I have to. You have to. You have have to to have a bodyguard. You're fearless. Uh, Another thing that that your skill, we've talked about it, is your ability to keep in your personal feelings despite, you know, people giving you so much bullshit on their uh, uh, about their positions that are totally wrong that you understand clearly understand that what they're saying is nonsense and yet you're able to carry on and uh, keep on with the interview and if you want to also inside of baseball I mean also the way I get them to so people always say to me how do you know how did, how did you get them to say that it's not about me getting them to say it but you do have to what and what's also difficult for me and this is speaks to my acting abilities is you have to connect with them on their level. Mm. And so what I have to do is, when I interview somebody, I have to spend five, six, 10, 15 minutes discussing how disgusting America is or how disgusting see. Jews are. And then they feel, then they feel they comfortable open up opening up to me. Right, oh, I see, I didn't know that. It That's cr- not on the video, of No, course. no, no, of course, because it wouldn't right. make sense, but but right. it's not taking anybody out of context at all, in fact. No, that is, no, uh, it just makes them comfortable. A criticism that I get often, which is, a, which is well, you led them down the path. I say, yeah, of course, but so what? I didn't make I didn't make them drink the water. Yeah. They 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 lustily grabbed and gulped the water. Mm-hmm. I didn't force it down. I didn't put their head back and right. You there's nothing you can say. There's no path you could take me down that I will say something I don't believe. 
right? No. No, you could, and most people. You could play. You could play the opposite of me and say and 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 be a conservative and whatever you want. But you're not going to get me to say things I don't believe, mm-hmm. right? What they say, they believe because they're saying it. They're saying it. They're saying it, and they're not being paid to say it. That they're taking time out of their day. They are actually thinking that they're they're helping get their word out by being interviewed. Sure. No, they're they're proud. They're, they're proud they're, of it. They're proud position. of it. They're they're proud of their stupidity. Well, there are a lot of life lessons here, and. Um, the one life lesson that I take away from this is that... Don't let your children do what I do. That's a, that's a pretty good life lesson. Not a good No, idea. I think you're doing a good job, and hopefully you're making nearly as much money as, uh, as you're making at Lehman Brothers. I mean, we don't get into that, but it, 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 hopefully, you know, you're doing okay, although it doesn't show in your, in your um, uh, choice of clothing hey, anymore. Hey, yeah, yeah. hey, hey. But you, you're going to be a man of the people. That was unnecessary. Yeah, no, you've got to be a man of the people. You've got to be like, uh, like a college kid, dressed like a college kid. But the, the biggest lesson that I see here is that, um, that the people on the left are, are so frozen in their beliefs uh, and, and so willing to talk about their beliefs uh, and not, not debate them, but they're willing to talk about them. This is what I firmly believe in. And, uh, and those beliefs are totally wrong. That's the lessons from watching your videos that, that the beliefs that the left has, whether it's about race or religion uh, or the economy, every one of those beliefs is glaringly wrong. And you and I worry that, that the left is now in charge of our country. And if they have the wrong beliefs, then our country is going to go in the wrong direction. Uh, people talk about, uh, we've got to follow the science. Well, what about following the facts? Following the facts that blacks do have IDs. Every black that we talk to has an ID. So voter, voter uh, rules, uh, uh, rules on voting, are not racist. They're made to protect the voting process, to make sure it's correct that the person who you say you are, the person who shows up, is you. So uh, thank you so much, Ami, for, uh, for coming and talking to me today. But thank you so much more, so much more for devoting your time, your effort, and taking the risks that you take to expose the fallacy of the left. My pleasure. Truly my pleasure. I, it was a lot of fun. You really get to do these these long form interviews, right? They're usually like five, 10, 15, maybe 20 minutes. It's rare to have a long form, thoughtful interview. Um, and I encourage everybody to watch not just this video, but all your other videos because there are life lessons here. They, really, they truly are, and they're important. Thank you again, Ami. Thanks so much for listening to another episode of Life Lessons with Dr. Bob. If you enjoyed these interviews with some of today's most influential thought leaders, please follow and rate the show on your favorite podcast platform. And don't forget, you can also watch each episode on YouTube as well. We'll see you next time.